Ready to go back to a time of dial-up internet, warehouse raves, and questionable life decisions? This week on the No More Late Fees podcast, we're deep diving into the wild ride that is 1999's Go. Welcome to the No More Late Fees podcast. I'm Jackie. And I'm Danielle, and we're just two best friends and ex-Blockbuster employees rewatching some of the best and worst movies of the late 90s and early 2000s. This week, we are talking about the 1999 indie Go with our returning guest, Megan. Welcome, Megan. Hello. Welcome hey, back. guys. <laughs> If you want to get to know Megan a little bit better, make sure you check out our bonus episode after that drops in later this week. Or in the meantime, go take a listen to our new guy and Detroit Rock City episodes that we covered with Megan earlier. Yes. <laughs> 1999. <laughs> this is a good year for movies. It was. But, Seriously. But before we dive in, let's get into some housekeeping. If you love the podcast and you want to support us, here's a few ways that you can. Transform from a listener to a podcast superhero. Your reviews are the secret sauce that fuels our journey to podcasting greatness. Join the ranks of the mighty by leaving your mark on Apple, Spotify, Podchasers, iHeartRadio, Good Pods, or wherever your podcasting heart leads. Let's, let's amplify our voices together and conquer the airwaves. And while you're conquering, make sure you hit the subscribe button so that you get notifications when our new episodes are live. And are you ready to step into the limelight and unlock the ultimate VIP experience? Dive deep into the heart of Hollywood excitement with exclusive content straight from the cutting room floor, collectible gifs worthy of the silver screen, live sessions that'll have you feeling a, like a star on set, and access to our sizzling hot Spotify playlist that set the stage for blockbuster moments. Don't miss your cue. Head on over to patreon.com slash no more late fees and claim your starring role as one of our besties today. All right, let's get into go. Grocery store clerk Simon occasionally sells drugs from his cash register at work. So when soap opera actors Adam and Zach come looking for ecstasy on a quiet Christmas Eve, they're surprised to find Rana covering his shift. Just desperate for money, Rana decides to become an impromptu drug dealer, unaware that Adam and Zach are secretly working for obsessed narcotics officer Burke. The movie stars Katie mm -hmm. Holmes, Jay Moore, Sarah Pauly, Scott Wolf, Tay Diggs, Brecken Meyer, James Duvall, Timothy Oliphant, mm -hmm. and William Fitchner. The movie was directed by Doug Lyman and screenplay written by John August. You can watch it currently on Amazon or YouTube for rent for $3.59. Mm -hmm. Let's get into our ratings rewind. So you know the drill. Before we get into the movie, we'll reveal the rating our Y2K versions of ourselves would give. Then at the end, we'll see if our current selves agree with our initial rating. Our scale consists of would buy it, would buy it again. The best would play and repeat. Five day rental. Would watch again. Two day rental. Mm, okay, but nothing to write home about. And same day rental. It's pretty much a shit filled garbage pile. It's trash. <laughs> <laughs> so Megan, what is your Y2K rating of Go? Would buy, would buy again. Is that what it is? Yes. <laughs> yes, definitely. It's a would buy for me, Jackie. It's a would buy. I was, I don't think I realized what a huge No Doubt fan I was. <laughs> <laughs> also, Gwen Stefani. Like, yes, I know that she's problematic for her appropriation. And not only for her appropriation, but also the fact that she doubled doubles down on it when confronted with it, even to this day, she still like doesn't apologize for it and is just real cringe. But let's be honest, for a hot minute there, that bitch was top tier. Yeah. She definitely. has such a unique voice that like and like the the music is just so jammy. It's hard to not yes. feel good <laughs> listening to it. And her aesthetics were great. Like, who rocks braces and rocks out and nobody <sighs> makes fun of that shit? Right. In this era, she was wearing braces. Mm-hmm. 
Gotta give it to her. Gotta give it to her. Anywho, that song on the soundtrack definitely influenced me saying, I got to see this movie. And it did disappoint at the time. So what about you, Jackie? Would buy for me. I liked anything like super indie. And this felt like a Quentin Tarantino-esque style movie where it's like disjointed editing and you see one storyline that feeds into another. So I was totally into it. It definitely wasn't indie. It started off with a lower budget and they kept getting money gradually throughout the movie, but the process of making the movies, but the budget was $20 million and it made $28.5 million. Actually, when it was about to start shooting, its foreign financing fell through because the film lacked a bankable white male star. Oh, that sounds familiar. (laughs) Yeah. So Columbia Pictures actually stepped in and financed the film, but this movie was very indie. Like the way that they ended up shooting and we'll get into all of that was it had probably more money than most indie productions do, but it still was, they were scrapping for real. Mm -hmm. So you ready to hear what little Raj had to say? Always. Roger Ebert. (laughs) (laughs) So Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times stated that Go is an entertaining, Mm -hmm. clever Black comedy that takes place entirely in Tarantino land. Go has energy and wit, and the performances are right for the material. Especially Sarah Polly, who thinks fast and survives harrowing experiences, and Fitchner, the cop who is so remarkably open to new experiences. Hmm. We'll get into that. I didn't realize that the director of this movie made so many bangers. Doug Lyman, he has made Mr. and Mrs. Smith, The Born Identity, Swingers, Edge of Tomorrow. Legit. I'm pretty sure he did the OC show as well, really? or at least a lot of the episodes. Yeah, he was like a producer, director, something of the OC. Well, that's why this movie speaks to our heart. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> For sure. And I love that he's done all these movies and he still says that he considers Go to be his best film. Like, he's just like us, y'all. <laughs> so this movie came out August 24th, 1999 on VHS. And man, it was a good time to be alive. Simply right. Irresistible. Romy and Michelle's High School Reunion, Mr. Holland's Opus, Sense and Sensibility, Dirty Work, which came out in 98, but I guess it took a while to come out in VHS for some reason. The Mod yeah. Squad and Yuli's Gold. I feel like Yuli's wow. Gold is the old one, though. Yeah, probably. Yeah. It probably just got a like a re-release or something. But before we dive into the casting, let's hear a word from our pod pals. It definitely was an indie. It... Started off with a lower budget and they kept getting money gradually throughout the movie, but the process of making the movies, but the budget was $20 million and it made $28.5 million. Actually, when it was about to start shooting, its foreign financing fell through because the film lacked a bankable white male star. Oh, that sounds familiar. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So Columbia Pictures actually stepped in and financed the film, but this movie was very indie. Like the way that they ended up shooting and we'll get into all of that was it had probably more money than most indie productions do, but it still was, they were scrapping for real. Mm -hmm. So you ready to hear what little Raj had to say? Always. Roger Ebert. (laughs) (laughs) So Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times stated that Go is an entertaining, Mm -hmm. clever Black comedy that takes place entirely in Tarantino land. Go has energy and wit, and the performances are right for the material. Especially Sarah Polly, who thinks fast and survives harrowing experiences, and Fitchner, the cop who is so remarkably open to new experiences. Hmm. (laughs) We'll get into that. (laughs) Right. (laughs) <laughs> I didn't realize that the director of this movie made so many bangers. Doug Lyman, he has made Mr. and Mrs. Smith, The Born Identity, Swingers, Edge of Tomorrow. Like, legit. I'm pretty sure he did the OC show as well, really? or at least at least a lot of the episodes. Yeah, he was like a 
producer, director, something of the OC. Well, that's why this movie speaks to our heart. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. And I love that he's done all these movies and he still says that he considers Go to be his best film. Like, he's just like us, y'all. <laughs> So this movie came out August 24th, 1999 on VHS. And man, it was a good time to be alive. Simply right. Irresistible, Romy and Michelle's High School Reunion, Mr. Holland's Opus, Sense and Sensibility, Dirty Work, which came out in 98, but I guess it took a while to come out on VHS for some reason. The Mod yeah. Squad and Yuli's Gold. I feel like Yuli's wow. Gold old one though yeah probably yeah it probably just got a like a re-release or something but before we dive into the casting let's hear a word from our pod pals what's up dudes i'm jerry d of totally rad christmas the podcast that talks all things christmas in the 80s toys movies specials music books fashion and fads if it was gnarly during christmas in the 80s he's got it covered so tune in to Totally Rad Christmas everywhere you get your podcasts. Turn the clock back and dive into those warm and fuzzy memories. Later, dudes. Now let's talk about cast and crew because the casting, there's a lot of fun stories. So let's start with after viewing Swingers, John August, who wrote the film, and the producers felt like Doug Lyman would be the perfect fit. And Lyman did sign on soon after. I think it took a little convincing, though, for him. And the funny story is that, guess what movie he was, like, they were trying to position him to make for instead of this one. They were like, if you do another indie, you're going to mess, you know, it's going to mess up, like, it'll be a while before another big studio opportunity comes. Yeah. Heartbreakers. Our movie oh. Heartbreakers. But it's wow. weird because we know that movie didn't come out till, what was it, like 2004? Early 2000s, yeah. So. Was it really? I feel like maybe it was. Maybe was it 2001 I thought it was 2004? I thought it was 99, no? No. 2001. Yeah. Okay, so 2001. It would have taken yeah. just a little bit. But yeah, I was surprised by that. And I was wow. like. I love Go, but man, I love me Heartbreakers. Oh. <laughs> it's so good. It's so Anywho. ridiculous. <laughs> it is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Casting was problematic due to the fact of the adult nature of this movie and the plot and the fact that teenage actors would have been too young to portray half the actions in the script. So when it was decided to cast slightly older actors, it just made sense that could pass for teenagers. So uh, I'm not surprised by that. And I'm I'm grateful. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Commented. Thank you for doing that. Jeez. Yeah. Just watching this movie, I was like, man, this just makes me want to watch Dawn of the Dead so bad because <laughs> yeah. Sarah Polly's so good. And that's my favorite, like, yes, horror She's movie from that genre. Oh, so good. We had totally different thoughts and this, this <laughs> is, i think about? this is the epitome of our, how we are personality was <laughs> seeing sarah polly you thought dawn of the dead yeah i thought <laughs> Ava, avon lee my girl from canada oh. i <laughs> love that fucking show and it it was it's a pipeline see it started with Anne and green gables right <laughs> <laughs> I think you talked about this last time. Yeah. <laughs> she can always bring it back to Anne of Green Gables. <laughs> oh my god, that's impressive! It's a pipeline from Anne of Green Gables <laughs> to Avonlea. I do love a period piece. I don't want to be in that period of time because it, it wasn't great was for little... <laughs> yeah. y'all. Yeah. <laughs> Anywho. <laughs> I do love that that Tay Diggs was like one of the first people that they hired. And so the casting director, Joseph Middleton, he saw Tay Diggs in a production of Rent. So we all know he started on Broadway. And he actually had Lyman fly out to New York to meet him for the part of Marcus, which I thought was cool. Um, That's awesome. We had talked about in our Brown Sugar, was it Brown Sugar episode? How we were this year not this season because it summer season three summer season four but all in 2024 we had very heavy tay diggs movies 
<laughs> and we forgot this one. Yes. So we're not doing three Tay Diggs movies. We're doing four, four Tay Diggs movies this year. That's it, amazing. It, it, 2024, the season of Tay Diggs. <laughs> <laughs> and here's where Love his it. head should just pop up. Everywhere. Oh, I, I will. <laughs> but real. yeah, we, we did Brown Sugar. We are doing this movie. We're doing The Wood. Next and week. Next week. <laughs> what was the other one? What's and rent one? at the end of the year. And rent at the end. Damn, of the year. Yeah. y'all gotta I, find Malibu's most wanted in there. <laughs> that's what Danielle keeps saying. I'm like, please no. I am so I ready for that movie. <laughs> you don't understand. Let's go seriously. <laughs> because we keep the halls in it, and that's it. That's all I need. Like she is so fucking funny. I, I seriously, can't. that movie's a blast. And we've also done The Best Man with him, mm -hmm. as well as how, how Stella Got Her Groove Back. Nice. No more leafies featuring Tay Diggs. Tay Diggs. Mm -hmm. As Tay Diggs. <laughs> Tay, Get him. we are ready for you to be on the ready. show. Get him ready. on. Let's go. <laughs> Any more casting tidbits? Yeah, there's a few more about how we got our girl Sarah Polly. If you want to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Doug Lemon insisted on casting Sarah Polly after seeing her in The Sweet Hereafter from 1997. She was offered the role directly without auditioning. Sounds about right. I love that she's also transitioned into directing and she's been she did she, didn't she win an Oscar or yeah. she was nominated? She did she win? I think she won. I don't I mean, know if it was for the screenplay. I think it might have been for writing, but she is one of those child stars that seamlessly went into adult roles and she's very private and quiet too. Like they said that she didn't actually do any press or she didn't really talk or inter was interviewed about this movie or talked about this movie until the 20th anniversary in 19 wow. in 2019. So she has won two Oscars for best adept, but they had Christina Ricci and Melissa Joan Hart lined up in consideration in case Sarah Polly wasn't available, but your girl got the wow. Role. Well, they kept asking her. She kept saying no. So I thought that was interesting. Like who Sarah Polly? Yeah. She kept saying no. She said she wanted something a little bit more serious. She was looking for more dramatic roles. She just didn't see it. And then Doug, Lyman actually, and I think his producing partner kind of cornered her. They told her talent agent that if she didn't come and meet with them when she was, she was in LA at that time, if she didn't come and meet with them, that they wouldn't see any of their other talent to be potentially in the movie. So that's how they got a meeting. And then one of his friends or somebody he works with, it might be his producing partner, actually wrote all over the script and he's always usually harsh about this anything. So he wrote dumb line, take it out. Like it was just all marked up and she wanted to see the script again. And that was the only script they had. So he gave it to her and he was like, that's probably not the most professional, but it's actually probably what got her to do the movie, which was right. really cool. It says on IMDb that she says in interviews that she only took the role because she loved the line in the opening scene and look how far it got you. Yeah. I guess she was like, okay, I, I don't know. The She's got backs are yes. amazing. Exactly. And she does it so deadpan too, like without yeah. attitude, mm -hmm. it's just like sullen and just like, well, here we are. Totally. <laughs> Any more casting tidbits? Yeah, there's a few more about how we got our girl Sarah Polly. If you want to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Doug Lemon insisted on casting Sarah Polly after seeing her in The Sweet Hereafter from 1997. She was offered the role directly without auditioning. Sounds about right. I love that she's also transitioned into directing and she's been, she, did she, didn't she win an Oscar or yeah. she was nominated? She, did she win? I think she won. I, I don't mean. know if it was for the screenplay. I think it might've been for writing, but she is one of those child stars that seamlessly went into adult roles and she's very private and quiet too. Like they said that she didn't actually do any press or she didn't really talk or inter was interviewed about this movie or talked about this movie until the 20th anniversary in 19 wow. in 2019. So she has won two Oscars for best adapted. Look at my girl from Avonlea to Grammy. No, sorry. <laughs> from Avonlea 
to Oscars. <laughs> <laughs> she may win a Grammy. Who knows? She might be an EGOT. I don't know if she can sing. Maybe she'll do a spoken word. <laughs> Uh, but they had Christina Ricci, Ricci and Melissa Joan Hart lined up in consideration in case Sarah Polly wasn't available. But your girl got the wow. Role. Well, they they kept asking her. She kept saying no. So I thought that was interesting. Like who Sarah what, Polly? Yeah, she kept saying no. She said she wanted something a little bit more serious. She was looking for more dramatic roles. She just didn't see it. And then Doug. Lyman actually, and I think his producing partner kind of cornered her. They told her talent agent that if she didn't come and meet with them when she was in LA at that time, if she didn't come and meet with them, that they wouldn't see any of their other talent to be potentially in the movie. So that's how they got a meeting. And then one of his friends or somebody he works with, it might be his producing partner, actually wrote all over the script and he's always usually harsh about this anything. So he wrote dumb line, take it out. Like it was just all marked up and she wanted to see the script again. And that was the only script they had. So he gave it to her and he was like, that's probably not the most professional, but it's actually probably what got her to do the movie, which was right. really cool. It says on IMDb that she says in interviews that she only took the role because she loved the line in the opening scene and look how far it got you. <laughs> Yeah. I guess she was like, okay, I, I don't know. The She's got backs are yes. amazing. Exactly. And she does it so deadpan too, like without yeah. attitude, mm-hmm. it's just like sullen and just like, well, here we are. Totally. <laughs> so Katie was saved by Go because, yeah, I loved her character and just I thought she was great in this movie. I think this is my favorite performance of hers, especially at the end when she meets back (laughs) up with Todd. Like I was like, this is, this is excellent. (laughs) I want a whole movie about this. (laughs) Yes. I just felt like I liked this part because who didn't want to make out with Timothy Oliphant? Same. Same. And I could, and I, I I appreciate you putting his picture right in the middle so that I can stare <laughs> at it the entire time. <laughs> and I I mean uh, in my notes it was really hard not to call him Mickey, but uh, I refrained. <laughs> yeah, I was trying to do the map. I was like, oh, he did Scream Two before this, because he still had oh, that like oh. Scream Scream Two yes. hair color vibe or whatever. Yes. But like, okay, here's my question though. Do you like him better in this one or Girl Next Door? Oh, Todd Gaines all the way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) I want like the net neck tat and the weird like not quite a mutton chop, but like definitely like. (laughs) But I loved all of it. (laughs) I'm glad you brought up the neck tattoo. Cause you know, Mama loves a neck tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> I can I can write a thesis on a neck tattoo. Oh my so God. the funny thing is that Timothy thought the character needed a neck t- tattoo. Agreed. He knows what's mm-hmm. sexy. However, yeah. the director Doug didn't didn't agree. He thought it was a bad idea because it would make him appear too sinister, sir. No, there's yeah. No- I'm kidding he's selling drugs right. are you kidding me uh, the next day though oliphant showed up with his tattoo it's a temporary tattoo of a pair of flaming dice that the makeup department had stamped on his neck and lyman ended up liking it and it stayed in the movie Excellent. so hell yeah bravo sir i am shocked that he was fired off of practical magic and replaced with aiden quinn which just in my humble opinion downgrade <laughs> every time I, I can't wait till we do practical magic which we're doing this year um because i do have thoughts about that and i feel like him and sandra bullock would have been up in fire flames. i i wow. do love i do love Aiden we were robbed we, we were. were robbed but i want to know like it's not even just like he decided to leave but fired is such yeah, a strong word t- what happened Maybe he came in with the neck tattoo. Everybody combusted <laughs> into flames. 
They're like, no, Seriously. he is too hot for practical magic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I I love that he ended up playing Todd because apparently he auditioned for Adam or Zach. Uh. But then they all agreed that it was better for him to play Todd. And yes. Wow. But then... did anyone else audition for um, Todd Gaines? Todd? Do we know? Glad that you asked because Jay Moore, <laughs> he had gotten the lead in the movie, but he wanted to be Todd. So much so that even when he had his role, he was still pushing to be the dealer. He was taking oh my you know, pusher too far. Wow. But this was, we have to remember that Jay Moore came right off of Jerry Maguire at the time. And so like he got a ton of roles, he said, thrown at him after that movie and really didn't have yeah. a problem on he set. He was in a bunch of 90s and 2000s movies, right? Yeah, yeah. 200 cigarettes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's what I was thinking of. <laughs> but yeah, one of the things that he said was that like, you know, he's coming off of getting all those movies and this was an indie movie. He really didn't have a problem until like the way that Doug Lyman was filming this movie, it was with an old school camera. So he was constantly filming and it just like didn't stop with the newer cameras. This is before digital. You, it would take like four minutes to kind of reset. And so people took breaks. He's like, I can't take a nap. <laughs> Go, I, I haven't been able to take a nap or do anything. Like we have been filming nonstop. So that was like yeah. the only thing that he kind of complained about it. But he said he really liked it because it reminded him of the days of when he would, you know, he's a comedian. So when he was in New York, he would be jumping to different right. clubs and stuff. So I thought that was funny. That's cool. And the deleted scenes on the DVD, you can it you can see how it's shot. Like it's just, it's basically just like a video camera, you know, and it just felt like real life. That's yeah. what I loved about this movie is like, it felt, it feels so like real, like this could be me and my friends hanging out, you know, and yeah. The conversations we would be having and shit like that i love day in the life movies i really do yeah like, there's so much so much fun so much shenanigans are happening but yeah doug and i think the actors had like a different response because he was literally being the dp he was literally holding the cameras and shooting directly with them so mm -hmm. it just i think it brought an intimacy to it as well for sure um, because they were trying to cut budget so much. You know what they ended up spending the most money on? What? Was Music? The car chase scenes. Oh, oh. yeah. They were yeah. they were advised. Where did they shoot do. those? I don't know. I didn't see that part, but I'm I don't know if they I I feel like they did they actually go to Vegas? Or but yeah, I feel like a lot of it was shot in Vegas, maybe yeah, probably out in like New Mexico and Nevada and shit. Yeah, I didn't see. They didn't have any. Let me shooting look in. Things. I'll, I'll yeah, see where their shooting up. locations are. Yep. La last two things. So Lyman originally did not want to cast Scott Wolf, which I thought was fun to have him in this movie because prior to mm -hmm. this, he had been pretty like straight laced. Uh, you know, Party of Five, very dramatic roles. What was that boat movie about the quals? He was in that. But like nothing, <laughs> you guys know what I'm talking about. I, I think yeah, so. White walls or something. You, Jackie, will find it. <laughs> um, but they cast Scott Wolf, and well, he was not really wanting to because Scott was on on Party of Five, and Katie Holmes was on the the Creek. That's what I want to call it. White Squall. I see White there. White Squall. <laughs> what From the 1996. Fuck? It's in that time frame, Danielle. <laughs> yes. Can't <Damn>. wait. <laughs> Tweet us, message us, call us if you want us to cover White Squalls. We'll do it as a Patreon. <laughs> Bonus. <Jeez. laughs> Bonus episode. <laughs> So yeah, he was hesitant on Scott Wolf because Katie Holmes was already signed on and he didn't want a movie that was just TV actors. But he saw him, Scott, talking to Jay Moore in the hallway and he realized that they had like a good amount of chemistry between the two of them. So I thought that was good. They did. They really did. Yeah, for sure. Chemistry. And lastly, Melissa McCarthy. This is her film debut. And I never, of course, we didn't notice when we were watching yeah. it because- we didn't know who she was yet but right i know 
That and was then it was a like, treat. You rewatch and you're like, of course that's Melissa McCarthy. <laughs> I like, know. how did I not remember that she played Jimmy the makeup guy's sister? <laughs> she was in Gilmore Girls. That's yes. right. When did that air? In the 2000s. I okay, so it was after after. Yeah, this was her film debut. Yeah, but she was giving very Suki vibes she was. for sure. Yeah. Yeah, it started in 2000. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like it was shot in the supermarket, gas station, Todd's apartment, and the rave were all in California, either LA or Santa Monica, Mm -hmm. and then the New Frontier Hotel and Casino in Vegas. Awesome. Oh, okay. I I think it's cool because... It makes a lot of sense now, like after watching the movie, but the writer originally wrote this. He wrote it as a short film just about Rana. Mm -hmm. And he titled it X, inspired by Rock and Roll, Ralph's Grocery Store and Sunset Boulevard. But then his friends kept asking about what happened to Simon when he went to Vegas and what happened (laughs) to Zach and Right. So he was like, okay, so that's why he ended up writing the other three parts, which is really cool. I mm-hmm. I love that for us. <laughs> Seriously. All right, Jackie, let's let's do this. Dive in. The Columbia intro is like so iconic when the movie starts. I think we had one of these on Detroit Rock City too. So that really? that's awesome. Yeah, it's just like they do the Columbia intro, but like as it starts, the rave is like starting at the same time. And mm-hmm. so the song, I want to say it's like Fire Up the Shoe, Sh- Shoe Saw. It's like some techno song comes on at the same time as like the Columbia thing. And it starts like going in and out and like flickering. And like, it's just the badass intro. <laughs> do, do y'all ha- do, have that. y'all, did y'all not see that? I was eating chips, Megan. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. I, my same. bad. I need to go back <laughs> now. So this is the portion of the movie that's from Rana's perspective. She is working as a supermarket checker. We find out very quickly she's about to be evicted, but she's only 17, which never made sense to me. Family life wasn't good. and She had to move out early and figure out life, you know? Yeah. Thank you you for the backstory. So she's been working. She worked a 14 hour shift. She goes to clock out and then Simon catches her and he's like, Hey, I want to go on a boy's trip to Vegas. Will you work my shift? I'll pay you in advance. So she goes to clock back in. Then we see Scott Wolf and Jay Moore's characters, Adam and Zach come through her checkout line. They're buying like an entire like basket full of frozen orange juice (laughs) <laughs> and really, they're not there to purchase anything in particular. They're looking for the British guy, Simon, who Ron is covering his shift because they need 20 hits of ecstasy for a party that they're having. And so Ron is like, well, I know the drug dealer. Sure, I'll, I'll get you, you drugs. <laughs> and so thus leads us on this insane night that happens. They hop in. I I don't even know whose car it is. It's just decorated for Christmas, which I always loved. I don't know. I felt like it's Manny's car. I felt like so too. Yeah. If it, you know what? And it's being decorated in Christmas. Like, I don't see Rana Rana. doing that. Yeah. I don't see Claire doing that. It has to be definitely Manny. (laughs) Yes, for sure. He's here. He's the the one who partakes. Yes. (laughs) Yes. So they go and meet Todd Gaines behind me. Hello. <laughs> and there she's trying to convince him. She's like, I know Simon buys from you all the time. And she kind of acts like it's for her personally. Mm-hmm. And we get this whole like thing about like, I don't do favors. I, I give a blowjob before I, I gave a favor. And I don't give blowjobs to Steve and my best friends, which I love like that whole <laughs> line. And so he makes he like I love this scene where he like turns the music up really loud and of course the music increases in volume in the scene or like for the viewer as well and then he's like whispering to her like essentially he wants to make sure that she's 
not wired and not working for the cops in any form or fashion. And so he makes her take her shirt off and spin around and stuff. But, and then like, as soon as that's done, he lowers the volume, the volume lowers for the viewers. Well, I'm like, it's just, it's a very simple scene, but it's highly impactful for me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Definitely. Because it shows that he's no dumb drug, deal- yeah. drug dealer <laughs> for sure. He knows what's up. Yeah, He knows the law. Yes. I feel like if we got more drug dealers in higher positions, we would be doing better as a country. They're very intelligent. <laughs> they are. They know you the know, law to the T. They know the law. They know science because they got to be coking that meth. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's, it's, you True. know, and and they also know what, what's the other. So I said they have to the be science. somewhat personable. But business they have to savvy. mean business. Yeah, yeah. they're business savvy. Yes. They know how to yeah. make a good deal. And they know they could spot, you know, if shit is a little fishy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hence, what happened with Rana? Like, yeah. Business. yeah. <laughs> when he hits, it's real convenient that you're asking for how much it would be for it to be considered that you are like, trafficking. like a fe- mm-hmm. trafficking. Yeah. Yes. And so she's like, nah, it's just, I, I'm having this party. And so he's like, okay, 15 bucks a hit. And she's like, well, I know Simon gets them for 10. And he's like, no, inflation, 15. <laughs> and she's yeah. like, I just have enough money for like 10 bucks a hit. And he, and can I leave you with collateral? And enter <laughs> for Claire, who's like, I don't want to sit with a drug dealer for 45 <laughs> minutes. And Ron is like, it'll be fine. I yeah. when I see this scene, I can so see me being Rana and Jackie <laughs> being Claire. Except Jackie would have never sat there as collateral. She'd be well, like, nah, bitch. Maybe if it was Timothy Oliphant. But... <laughs> maybe yeah. that's the one exception. <laughs> Shirtless and a Santa hat. Ooh. Yeah. I'll sit here with you. Yeah. Also, we missed a very important factor. The fact that when Rana comes in. There's already a a chick a chick there <laughs> there about to leave and she does a full on make out with him and it's just like oh okay and then just leaves casually right. I'm yeah jealous of that extra that day. <laughs> she did really go to town on that one uh, as you should <laughs> <laughs> so they tell Claire we'll be back by eight forty five minutes tops I just have to run it to this house get paid get back. Rana's not great with the directions. And so it takes her to 804 just to find the house. So Claire's already paging up a storm. Because we don't have cell phones at this point. We only have beepers. (laughs) And no Google Maps. I I can imagine how hard it is to navigate trying to find this house. Right. And so we see Manny hand her the bottle as she's getting out of the car. Little does she know, he snuck to for himself, so he's very excited. And she was warned, like, this is, like, pharmaceutical-grade shit. None of, yeah, none he of says that. One, one tab, one tab a, a hit, otherwise you'll be frying eggs off of them for a week. Yeah, <laughs> damn. And he says it's none of that crunchy granola herbal shit. Yes. I want to know what that is. What that? <laughs> what? He's like, it, it's yeah. what um, Rana be selling later to <laughs> kids that think they're rolling and they're just right. placebo affecting. <laughs> um, crazy. So Rana goes inside and she asks for some of the, they ask her if she wants anything to drink. She says some of the OJ would be great. And this is when we're introduced to Burke, William Finkter's character. And he comes back. He's like, no, OJ, but I got you a cerveza. And <laughs> that's Alarm when, bells. Yeah. She's like, <laughs> yeah, it ain't right. Like, no. and Adam and Zach are there just looking nervous. <laughs> and the, the, the place looks all staged. And yeah. like, right. so weird. Like, it was just so sketchy. <laughs> Honestly, I, I remember I watching that for the first time and having like a full on panic attack. Like I was like, <laughs> no, no. Like I was just freaking out for this her. This is a kill room. <laughs> yeah. I would have just been nervous because there's just three guys. Yeah. It's not like a party. I would have felt like 
something could happen to me besides just like the drug aspect but they very much were giving off narc vibes and Mm -hmm. i i do love how seamlessly she kind of like dealt with the situation Mm -hmm. oh yeah and we learn later that was it who's adam which one's zach which one's adam adam is scott wolf okay so zach mouths to her go yes yes i would love i needed i would I was looking to see if they would say it somewhere. How many times the word go is actually said in this movie? Because it's a I lot. Know. Yeah. For different really reasons. <laughs> <laughs> so she ends up asking to use the restroom. She goes in in a panic. She can't get the lid off the bottle. Like pills go everywhere. She's trying to flush him. Meanwhile, Burke is trying to get into the bathroom. There's like a little window like up above the door. Also, why did to- she flush them? I would just... I would have just like stuffed them in my pants or something, yeah, just hit yeah. them on me and, you know, did whatever she said she was going to do. I mean, she didn't have to, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely. Seemed... Like, because they weren't going Unnecessary. to. Unnecessary. Yeah. Because they didn't have like probable cause to like search her or anything. Mm-hmm. She could have just been like, oh, sorry, couldn't get them. Thanks for the beer and walked out. But yeah. she's also 17 and has never been a drug dealer before. So <laughs> she panics right. a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> but what? she oh. she flushes them and then he opens the door as she's walking out and she's like, it's all yours. Like mm-hmm. she was so great in that scene though. Like okay. she really just killed it. <laughs> what I never understood is why she even went back to get clear right away. Why didn't she because it seemed like that plan of selling like the Tylenol and whatnot Mm -hmm. was already brewing. Why not go to the rave, sell some, get them the hundred dollars pay off what's his face and then be done. Yeah. Why fuck with this crazy drug dealer? Well, I think, I think she was just like what Claire was blowing up her pager and she was like, I got to get Claire back. So I need to come up with a plan. But to trust the very high <laughs> man to identify <laughs> what the pills look like. Yeah. But she was never going to get away with that. Like, no. eventually he was going to see whether or not they were the same shape. He would have known. Like, and they he have knows little numbers who you are. Yeah. Yeah, no. It was a bad, bad plan. Yeah. But I, I'm sure she was under a lot of pressure because, like you said, Manny was starting to fucking trip. He was so also, sweaty. She still let Manny drive to the store. <laughs> yeah, she gave no fucks. She was just like, let's get out of here. <laughs> She's like, drive. Bitch, he's gonna kill you. <laughs> he's gonna have a whole dance scenes in his little brain. <laughs> <laughs> he's that not on this plane. Amazing. <laughs> I love that dance scene. Hey, Macarena. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, so they go to the grocery store where she works. So she's and she steals a whole bunch of medication. She's like not allergy good, medicine. Yeah. Yeah, but she's not doing a good job stealing either because she's making a mess <laughs> and knocking you things know? over. Like she did not look inconspicuous at all. Like, no. baby girl, just take one off the shelf, kind of look at it, and then slide <laughs> <laughs> yes because you have so much experience thieving I, want, I will <laughs> y- you are correct i am not the thieving type however <laughs> i've watched enough movies to know <laughs> so they go back to get claire uh, she convinces todd to take back the pills and as she's leaving he goes claire i just did you a favor and she's she says like it felt like a blow. Oh, here I thought it was a blow job and like walks out and I'm like the one liners in this movie. <laughs> yeah. Top notch. Oh, man. And what? Well, oh, so before Rana shows up, though, Todd starts giving creepy man <laughs> vibes. Yes. And he's like, Do you want to get laid for Christmas? And he keeps you overusing her name. Yes. Yeah. It was very much Mickey vibes from... And he's like, are you a virgin? And stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. Like, you were a 20-something, 30-year-old man, and I'm 17. Get get the step in, sir. <laughs> right. To mm-hmm. catch a predator. 
I'd catch this predator. It's fine. Jenny. <laughs> Glad someone said it. I'm <laughs> telling you, the sexual awakening that happened with Todd, the drug dealer, and go. I, know. I think I'm just going to get you some underwear <laughs> that says to catch a predator and then a picture of him from this movie. <laughs> Oh my god. So good. <laughs> the other main thing that happens in the whole Todd, Rana, Claire scene is that Manny comes up just tripping. Like, like he can't even hardly stand up straight. <laughs> and he has a mental conversation with the cat. Oh my god, that is my favorite part of the whole movie. <laughs> He's like, you're gonna die. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and Manny's just like, oh no. <laughs> As soon as the cat like jumps up on the couch, I'm like, oh shit, here we go. Like <laughs> pets and while you're tripping is just so crazy. So yeah, that scene was awesome. I can hear your thoughts. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, nobody notices this dude like tripping out in the corner right now. Like there nope. were other things going on, I guess. <laughs> so after they leave Todd the drug dealer's apartment. This is when Rana reveals she has this brilliant plan to sell the rest of the pills at the rave to recoup the money she has now lost. Because she's still going to be evicted if she doesn't have $340 by tomorrow. So they introduce themselves as Kelly and Donna. And yeah. to a no ho. Yeah. <laughs> and we already discussed the dance, the, the dance scene, right? Oh, no, yeah. no, no, no. Let's go back to the. <laughs> oh. we, ha- we just glanced over, and I feel like that doesn't do it justice. <laughs> no <laughs> way. No. So uh-uh. while Rana is very poorly shoplifting, Manny is in his own little Manny world. He starts, he, he's playing with the scanner and like making a beat. And then in his mind, he starts dancing to the Macarena with the other checkout lady. And they're like, he's throwing green beans in the air. They're laying on the produce. (laughs) They're sharing a banana. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Who was that actress? Was she somebody? I looked and I don't think she was. I, I think probably a bit part actress, like, but nothing significant. Right. Wow, oh, she was great. But that, that dancing scene. scene, and then you find out, like, it's all in Manny's head. Like, this is yes. not happening. <laughs> so great. And he's so just, like, great. basically, like, standing there drooling. <laughs> so Kelly and Donna are are selling, like, it's Benadryl and shit to all of these kids going to a rave. And they're in totally the buying lot. into it. Yeah. And I do really like the part where she she kind of, like in her own mind is this big time drug dealer because a kid comes up he's like oh i heard you got the good shit and she's like show me your tits and makes him spin (laughs) you do you rana (laughs) sometimes you gotta fake till you make it you know sometimes yeah especially the cojones you need to be selling fucking tylenol and shit i know (laughs) But I do like that she tells them that, like, look, you got to get it. It works better when you get really high with marijuana. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. At least smoke a lot something. of weed. Yeah. <laughs> and then this Todd realizes that she gave him, like, aspirin to replace the ecstasy she flushed. And earlier when he had Claire as ransom, she had told him about the rave, like gave him the flyer t- for the rave. So he's now going to hear or he's going to find Rana. And then to confirm his suspicions, he overhears some of the kids talking about like it's legit stuff. It's none of that crunchy herbal rave shit, which is what he said to Rana earlier in the movie. And so he's <laughs> like, I know she's hawking Benadryl up in here. Yeah. Yeah. It's about this time the the double dose of ecstasy is catching up with Manny. And he he's burning up just as Todd predicted. He's puking. He's he's unwell. And so Rana's solution is here, hide between these trash cans till morning. They're so lucky he's okay because yes. in in an alleyway, nonetheless. Yeah. yeah. I I would never do that to somebody. 
That's so and, fucked up. <laughs> well, I don't think that her intention was to really leave him for that long. She did have to go get right. the car. She's got to take him to the ER. But she forgot, right? Yeah. Well, she got hit by. <laughs> oh, hit yeah, by yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, she right. was in a bad way herself. <laughs> and yes. nobody else knew about him but her. I yeah, guess. she's like, hide like a little mouse. I'm going to go get the car and be right back. <laughs> and then. That's she- right. I almost called him Mickey. Todd catches up to her in the parking lot and he's like, you fucked me over. Uh, And he's threatening her with a gun and she starts running and gets hit by a Miata driven by Zach and Adam. Do you think that he really was going to shoot her? I don't know. Maybe. (laughs) I think so. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe not kill her, but maybe, like, yeah. shoot her in the leg or, you know, something. Yeah. I mean, yeah. why has he got that if he's not going to use it? Yeah. Maybe he'll <laughs> pistol whip her. Whatever. Yeah. Or something. That's true. Uh, no so problem. we see Rana fly off into a ditch, and we don't know if she's alive or dead. She's not moving. It, okay. The way that he acts in this scene is priceless. Like, this scene alone... <laughs> is hilarious because it's he says so much dialogue without saying a word in the fact that like the fuck (laughs) did this happen and then the way he's looking at them in the car in the miata he's like yeah are y'all fucking for real do you not see me like y'all just no you didn't just (laughs) and then he's kind of pointing and then they just drive away and he's just standing there like they do so many things. It's not even like they just hit her and keep going. Like they hit her, they back up, they go forward, they back up again. They stop. Yeah. <laughs> like there's so much happening. And he is like, I know. What the fuck? Like, and then they like zoom I and know. hit the brakes so that she flies off into the ditch. <laughs> and I love that he's like, you know what? Mm. I don't gotta do nothing. I'm gonna just yeah. Leave. He's like, well, thanks, I guess. Mission accomplished. (laughs) You know what? Now that I think about it, he was going to shoot. He would have shot her because he has no remorse. Even when he sees Claire later, he doesn't say, Mm -hmm. "Mm, your friend's in a bad way. (laughs) You're looking for your friend? Let's go make out. You don't give a fuck. That's fair. I know. I mean, he needs to be a drug dealer. (laughs) I am going to be a Todd apologist this entire movie <laughs> she's so far gone y'all she's like well they weren't that good of friends but, i mean she broke the code there was an agreement she broke the agreement no what one in this movie is a good person yeah she like you said she made so many horrible mistakes like horrible choices yeah decisions yeah. like she could have First off, not flush them. She could have, like you said, gone and sold and made the money before she went back to Todd. So, I mean, really, it was on her. <laughs> I would say there's two candidates for not horrible people in this movie. It's Singh. And Claire? No. And <laughs> and Manny. I don't think Manny's a horrible person. Mm-mm. He's so He's adorable. He was just trying to have fun. He just wanted yeah. some E. That's all. Claire's too whiny and straight laced for me. And she wasn't making smart decisions either. True. I mean, she was solution minded at the end, but we'll get to that a little bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> so, Simon. So, Simon, my boy. Now, I have to preface that as much as I love Sarah Polly in this movie, because of Abba Lee. I very much like this actor, Desmond Askew, because he was in Roswell. So, you know, I was happy to see him. He was. I need to rewatch Roswell. I loved that show. Anywho, so we meet Simon. We, you know, we saw that he approached Rana about taking his shift so that he can go to Vegas with his boys. So when we see him again after that exchange, he wakes up in the back of a trunk of a car, which... I'm still trying to figure out what the hell happened. I don't know if he fell yeah. asleep or if he took a drug, but he's in the back of the trunk and his yeah. friend, you hear laughing. So his friends have thrown him back there. What scared me the most about this is that he has a lighter 
And there looks like there's an oil canister or yes, something back there. There is. It's a gas can or something. I said, not nah, nah, this is not smart, but <laughs> this is just one of many dumb decisions that, that uh, Simon makes. Uh, halfway mm-hmm. through his storyline, I just wrote, I hate Simon. <laughs> <laughs> the shit he, he does. He has the British white man out the audacity, for sure. Yes. So then he is, he, we meet his friends. So we've got Marcus played by Tay Diggs, who I think he's the one getting married. Cause apparently this is, is this a bachelor party essentially or something? Is he getting married or was he just I talking just about his girlfriend? It was a boys, trip. boys trip. I think it's I, just a boys trip. Yeah. Okay. And I feel so. like Simon wasn't really invited. Like those are the <laughs> vibes I get. It's just like. He's oh just like, dealer. I've never been to Vegas. I want to go. Exactly. Like, yeah. This like friend someone group. mentioned it in, in passing and he's just like, yes, right. I will go. <laughs> Honestly, I don't even, it doesn't even matter because this friend group is not a solid group in the first place. I don't know how these people know each other. Okay. I don't know how they're friends because they're, it doesn't seem like they're real friends. So Marcus seems to be like the only one. Well, Singh doesn't seem too, too bad, but definitely Marcus seems to be the only one with some brain cells to rub together. <laughs> then we meet Tiny, played by Brecken Meyer. He's definitely giving Seth yeah. from Can't Hardly Wait vibes. He's, mm-hmm. I, I, I know some people don't like me using the word wigger, but that's what it is giving mm-hmm. where he's appropriating well, I mean, black culture. He uses the word. He uses the N word. And yeah. so- I try to take a deep breath and yes. stay within it. And because I know a white man wrote this movie. Well, you know what? I don't know for sure if a white man wrote this movie. I will check on that. But the use of the word, the N-word by a white man makes no sense. And then Tay Diggs, Marcus's character's re- reaction to it. He doesn't get super angry. He just is mm-hmm. like, what are you talking about? So. We learn that this character is very much trying to put on. He tells an entire mm-hmm. story about a girl. And and Marcus is like, mm, what are the details? Do you remember this? Do you remember that? And he's like, I don't remember, whatever. Who cares? Whatever. He's like, I care because you're telling the fucking story I told months ago. Like, yeah, you're not even, <laughs> what are you doing? So we kind of see what tiny's about Singh is driving and then we've got simon in the back just being whatever and then they get to the hotel in vegas and this is when we see that simon has todd's credit card and he's only using it to just book the room because he said that todd has points or he has discounts at this hotel with that credit card which I think is interesting because Todd just told us he doesn't do favors, but apparently yeah. this is a mm-hmm. this looks like a favor to me. They seem Simon pretty- stole that credit card, and he wasn't wasn't he on the phone with si- Todd was on the phone yeah. with Simon yes. whenever Claire was sitting there and they were talking and stuff. It just seems doesn't seem like Todd to just give him his credit card. So. Yeah, but- yeah, but he like checks in and says like, "Hey, yeah, I'm here, whatever." So it does feel like Todd. But yeah. he does say, Simon does say, like, I'm just using the credit card to get the discounts, but I'm going to be paying with cash. So it's not like he's actually okay, going okay. the credit card. So right. so we think, or so Todd thinks, I mean, Todd thinks that when probably when he gave him the credit card. Before they get their room, they go to the buffet to eat. And this is when we learn a little bit about Marcus. He's talking about tantra, tantra sex and tantric sex and his girlfriend. And they're asking a bunch of questions about that. And he's saying how he can go for hours, like literally trying to be sting, essentially, like mm-hmm. without coming. And then while they're at the buffet, Marcus says to Sing and Tiny, you know, don't stop fucking with that shrimp. Don't eat that shrimp, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. They all eat. Those two idiots get, eat the shrimp. They get back to the room. They are fucked up. They're mm-hmm. shitting and stinking sick. up the room. They are sick. We also learn that their hotel is adjacent to another room. And there's a little or kid if you open door. the door, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they are not the nicest of the little kid. And this is when, when Todd and Simon are talking on the phone. And he does ask Todd if he's going to fuck 
or have sex with. Sorry, but I think he does say fuck. Whoa, Claire. not Claire. 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 Yeah. <laughs> So now the Tiny and Sing are out. Marcus and Simon decide they're going to go hit the town. They go hit the, obviously, they go hit up the casino first. Obviously, Simon loses all his fucking money. Within five minutes, he's already asking Marcus for money. And Marcus takes his wallet and he's like, That is the most friend-like thing that happens (laughs) in this whole segment is, him saying, let me have your wallet. Like, you're making stupid decisions right yes. now. Yes. Yeah. The thing that we learn later is the way that Marcus and Simon become friends, which I think is hilarious, is because they both went to driving school together. That's yes. how they know each other. And we see both of them drive recklessly. Also, yes. because Tay Diggs is from New York, he had to learn how to drive to for this movie because he did not have his license prior. I read that. I yes. love that Hilarious. fun fact. <laughs> <laughs> Which is very New York. I know a lot of my New York friends who do not know how to drive. Anywho, so another thing to that happens is that Marcus is getting a lot of like micro, he's dealing with a lot of racial microaggressions yes. where people are treating him like staff. Mm-hmm. He is treated like an attendant. Someone throws cash at him or when he's in the bathroom just being nice i think in some ways they were trying to make it seem like because he was wearing that jacket because yes but i was wearing a yellow jacket yeah but it doesn't make him look like an attendant it was just micro racist microaggressions he also as him and simon are like walking out this guy just throws his keys as if he is a parking attendant. So they take this car, this sports car, and they just what are like, okay, fuck it. it you know, I don't know. Do you? <laughs> what it's is a it? Ferrari. Oh, no. So I, my Barbie had a Corvette. That's all I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so they take the Ferrari and they end up going to the Crazy Horse Strip Club because it was one of Todd's recommendations. But oh. as they're in the car, before they get to the crazy horse, fucking Simon finds a gun in the gloves compartment. This scene made me so uncomfortable. I'm like, bruh, like, not only are you, like, pointing it in your face, you don't know how to work it. And I get, like, what I kind of gleaned was, like, because he's British and they're not allowed to have firearms, like, he had no idea. But I'm like, you've watched a movie before. Like, right. you know not to point at anyone And he's just like looking down the barrel, trying to eject the magazine, like waving her around. It gets pointed at Marcus. Like it is bananas Mm -hmm. how he is acting with this gun. It's very, very uh, like I, you know, Megan, when you said you were having like anxiety. That happens a lot in this movie. Yes. Yes. (laughs) I was feeling anxiety during this scene. It's a nail biter for sure. So they go to the crazy horse. Now, Marcus, where he messed up was he should have asked Simon if he had that fucking gun. Yes. Right. And so, but be, but he does give him like a child speech, like, when we go in the store, you better not ask for a goddamn thing. That's the kind of yeah. vibes he was giving. <laughs> so he tells Simon, look, when we go in here, order whatever drink you fucking want, but do not ask for champagne. And so, you know, Simon's like, why? Because... It's for a private dance and we do not have the money for that. You definitely don't have the money for that. And I can't even cover you on that. So do not ask for champagne. And so like, he's made it very clear. And the first set of tits that gets in Simon's face, he's like, I would like to order your best champagne. (laughs) And now, now they're in the fucking back room. And then they get, I don't know why Marcus doesn't say like, look, he didn't mean it. He don't want yeah. no champagne. But he goes along with it. And I'm like, y'all are not thinking this through. But then they go to the back room. And the bouncer guy says, look, I've only got a few rules for you. Do not touch the girls. Yeah. That's it. You, They can touch you, but you can't touch them. And at this point, Simon pays with Todd's credit card. Just mm. many more mistakes. More mistakes. And they go back to the champagne room, and guess what? Fucking Simon does. Grabs the ass. Grabs her ass. He touches. <laughs> he touches. And so the girls already, they have their code, touching, 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 and the bouncer comes in. 
and starts to beat that ass and Mark. But the funny thing is that again, another little microaggression is that he, as soon as he comes in and he hears that the girls were like, they were touched. Who does he go after first? Marcus. Marcus. Yeah. And not Simon. And they were like, the girls are like, no, no, it's this one. <laughs> and and yeah. he starts to wail on Simon. Well-deserved. I, if I was Marcus, I'd have been like, you got to take your L, sir. Yeah. I love you. But this is not a situation where I could jump in because like. I warned you. He warned right. you. Everyone warned yeah. you. And Marcus does try to step in and he gets hit. He's bleeding. And what does Simon do? Instead of just like, he could have just pulled the gun and scared them, but he doesn't do that. He pulls out the gun and he shoots the bouncer. In the arm. In the arm. Yeah. And so then, then they tell the girls like, where's the back alley? Where, where the, how do you get out of here? Mm -hmm. So they leave, they take the car, they're driving, they're freaking out. And the car phone starts ringing, which is probably the owner, like, where the fuck is my car? Which <laughs> I feel like would have been too soon. Like, I feel like he would have just thought it was valeted and just been in the casino for a while. So who knows? Yeah, because, I, I, well, we don't know how long they were in the crazy horse. That's true. They could have been in there for a while. And then as they're driving, genius Simon decides to throw the gun out of the car. He's like, I gave rid of the weapon. <laughs> And Marcus is like, I could just feel him go, <gasps> like, yeah, bitch, your As prints you are all prints. right. Your prints are all over the gun. Ugh. Fucking wow. <laughs> Wait, was was this before or after he banged those two girls? Oh right, and, sorry, and I did in the I, fire. I did we, miss that part. Out of all of the most ridiculous things that happened in this movie, that is this part is the most ridiculous and <laughs> when guess. marcus took simon's wallet he decides to wander and he stumbles upon a wedding and he somehow ends up flirting with two of the bridesmaids and they are easy as easy can be at this point that british <laughs> accent got bitches blind essentially <laughs> and they take him back to their room and they're smoking it looks like a crack pipe to me but i i know it was probably there <laughs> Well, I don't know. Let's and hope not. One of the dumbass things that the girl does is she puts tissues up her nose. She's like, it's the only way to inhale. Bitch. Like, I would have been, everyone would have known. Like, if you had tissue in your nose. Yeah. And tissue goes up in flames so quickly. Right. Why would you try to burn the pipe so, like. Oh, my God. It was so dumb. <laughs> so then. She like freaks out and the tissue falls to the floor. And of course they all work to like getting out the fire or whatever. But they, they leave just continued fucking while the fire yeah. was up in flames and they leave the, the, the curtains caught. Yes. <laughs> yes. If they had picked up the tissues and just like made sure they were out the first time, it wouldn't have been a problem. And the way to calm her nerves, Simon is like trying to make out with her or whatever. And so they have sex Simon is also high. They're all high, but yeah. he sees that now somehow the tissue has caused the curtains to be in flames. And it's he's still just watching because he's, he's just like because <laughs> he's practicing tantric sex. Now. Right. Yes, that's Would what you, it is. I want to know if there was a scene where Marcus like told him, described him, because just because you hear about tantric sex doesn't mean you just mm -hmm. automatically know how to do it. Like he said it mm -hmm. took him a while to to like get there no simon simon just thinks he's the sexual god <laughs> in his own mind well shit's on fire simon's a horrible human being so he leaves the girls behind and he tries to take the elevator which i'm surprised the elevator is even working and he's when there's naked, a fire he's running naked yes right. But that's when he catches up with Marcus, doesn't tell him any of that shit, and then they yeah. have the crazy horse <laughs> shenanigans. So then those two idiots come back to the hotel, run upstairs, and they're like, we got to go. <laughs> but while that's happening, they don't realize that the club owner is, that's the, that's his son that got shot. So he's like, giving some, <laughs> give some boomer speech about our generation or gen z gen x generation he has 
the type of veneers where they like turn yellow and over time and i was just like oh sir your teeth it's <laughs> Yeah, good look. <laughs> he's definitely got some chompers. And somehow, like, without internet, without surveillance, they're able to track these oh, mofos down. They, because they are the able to card. see, yeah, because they left the credit card that it was used at the hotel. So they called the room, and the other two knuckleheads that are in the room, they're like, What room are you in? And they should have questioned that, but they were like, oh, six something. And <laughs> I love that Tiny's like just saying it and sings like, well, what, who was that? He's like, oh, yeah. I don't know who it was. I love, uh, I really appreciate this scene where they're watching like the hotel channel where it's explaining how to play all of the casino games because I grew up going to Reno every summer and that channel, like, we would watch it for hours. I don't know why. <laughs> but it would just always be on in the background. Some, like, old dude teaching you, teaching you how to play Baccarat and stuff. So I was like, That's I hilarious. remember those days. <laughs> That's a good catch. I didn't even remember that. I didn't. So even. Then the guys get back to their room. And they're, this is what annoys me. Like, I understand tiny wanting to know what the fuck is going on mm -hmm. but also another part of me knows if one of my friends says yo we gotta pack and go mm -hmm. i'm doing it i might be asking questions Same. but i'm already up and packing <laughs> and Dude. so after that the guys go downstairs to the garage they're able to bribe the little boy next door to open the door I love how the kid says $100. They're all putting money and Tiny goes, I got 10. Did y'all notice that he said he <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Tiny. Oh, that's so great. They get out. They go to the garage. They get in the car. I feel like they could have hid. But it was like, barely, they barely made it. They barely yeah, fucking they made it through that door. But I feel like they could have hid in the car and the guys, like, they wouldn't have, no, like, they didn't know what car they were driving. Yeah. If yeah, they had just, true. like, hid somewhere else, those guys wouldn't have found them. But they go, what kind of car was this one? Big body Bertha. That looked like a Suburban. I, I can't be sure, it, but I think it was a Suburban. Well, I don't know. It was It was one of those, like, old sturdy ones yeah. uh, so they sturdy. take off sturdy <laughs> and it was like that thing got hit a few times that gold car whatever it was so the guys are chasing them they're 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 driving somehow simon is the one driving and now we know why simon and marcus were in driving school because and i don't know what they learned because they didn't learn nothing horrible drivers um they they cause a few accidents. It's a car chase, essentially. And then they decide to go down this really tight alley and fuck up the car real bad. Oh, my gosh. It's, it's, I wanted to know whose car it was because I feel like somebody in the car should have been extremely mad about how fucked up the car was. Yeah. Right. That car shouldn't have been drivable after that. <laughs> no. Okay. They hit brick walls. They, it was something to be seen. But so somehow, the, the gold car was a Datsun. I'm still trying to find the what the big black, the black car. I, car I, I didn't care about that yeah. one. I wanted to know what the this one Smashed was. Smashed up one. Yeah. Okay. So they they're able to get away from the strip club owner and his son, and they head home. And they're like, you know what? They're not chasing us. They're not going to call the police. Let's just go home because. Simon's like ready to go into hiding at this point. He's like, right? I'm a I'm good. Let's go to Mexico. I take Cabo. Like as yeah. it is a game. <laughs> so they end up deciding to go home. And when he gets back, he doesn't go back to his apartment. He ends up going to Todd's. And when we get to Todd's house, Todd has he's with Chloe and Mr. Owner and Son track back todd's credit card but to his first, address they, so they 
come over. They actually, they don't knock on his door. They catch those two make it out on the staircase. And oh, one, right. the dad is on the top of the stairs and the son is downstairs and they pull guns. And so what I love is that Todd literally write, like draws a map to where yeah. Simon yeah. lives <laughs> to be like, no, he lives here. This is where you find him, blah, blah, blah. And so, you know, Claire is watching all this and she's lost the mood. She she was like ready to bone and now she's like over it because they're all idiots. And so they're like, she's like, what do you guys even want? You know, because if you sh- or if you kill him, we're witnesses, like none of this is adding up. And so she's when she asked that, they're like, okay, we just want payback. So they decide they want to shoot Simon in the arm for retribution. So everything's square. Yeah. And at this point, Claire's like, fuck it, I'm out of this shit. And she leaves. And as she's leaving, which is such a great scene. You see her jump because you see the the gu- you hear the gun finally go off and you yeah. hear Simon go, I'm fine. <laughs> and and yeah, that's Simon's shenanigans. Yeah. So the last third is about Adam and Zach. So we find out that they're actors. They're actually on the TV behind Claire as Simon's asking Rana to take his shift. And so they're wired trying to find this drug dealer and get a drug bust so that they get out of trouble with this narcotics cop. But they also, when they're in the car with Burke, Burke is very intrusive in their love lives. (laughs) And he's like, oh my gosh, it's, it's so weird. Like you feel this sexual tension with Burke the whole time. And these (laughs) two. Mm-hmm. And you never get a payoff, which is so disappointing. But we find out Zach and Adam are lovers. And so Burke is asking questions about their girlfriends and is your girlfriend cheating on you? And he's like, Yeah, I found socks that were different than mine because of the <laughs> elastic. Because of the elastic. <laughs> such a petite, like, I wonder if that actually happened to the writer because it's yeah. such a specific thing. I know. Um, And then, oh, and then we see them kind of tailing Rana. We see her outside of Todd's apartment. We see her in the car with Manny. And so their plan is to not bust her. They want to bring her to their side and her become a narc to get to the drug dealer, Todd. It seems like. There's this weird scene where he's handcuffing Zach, where... I don't really understand. That was more of like the sexual tension I was feeling. And I was like, he was, I, at first I thought he was positioning himself to be like, you know how they have experts that help with the show, Mm -hmm. but he was just saying that like, he thought they did it wrong on TV all the time. And so he was trying to show how to do it, but it was very intrusive and sexual (laughs) in the way. And then yeah. he would take the handcuffs off. Yeah. It was weird. <laughs> so then we get Rana shows up. We get that whole scene with her. And then again, you feel like Burke's going to proposition them, but he's like, I'd just like you to, guys to come to Christmas dinner with me and my <laughs> wife. My wife's cooking Christmas dinner. So they're like, okay. And We see Adams making a phone call in the kitchen and the wife played by Jane Krasinski. Is that her last name? Mm. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And I'm wondering if this is the first time I've ever seen her in a movie. I I think it is is at the time I didn't. Yeah. Yeah. But I do love like when he Scott Wolf's character. Is that Adam? Yeah. Goes in how she is deliberately bent over. Yes. Yes. And the oh way in which that she she did a herself, bend and snap. She yeah. did. <laughs> and it was very much from a perspective of someone who is a dancer. You know what? That's not true. I see I saw her on Ally McBeal before I saw her in this. So I wow. I knew who she was before this. And then we see Zach is using the restroom. He washes his hands. And I guess the restroom is attached to their bedroom. Maybe they only have one restroom in their house. Yeah. And he walks out and Burke is like (laughs) naked as the day he was born. (laughs) Just hanging out. Franks and beans. Mm -hmm. All of it. And buns. (laughs) 
We got yes. the Franks, we got the beans, we got the buns. <laughs> <laughs> and he's just like, smell this. Doesn't it smell like CK1? Like putting <laughs> cologne on. <laughs> yeah. It's very much a naked house. That's all. <laughs> yeah. Well, we come to find out that there's no propositioning happening. It's just there are a couple of weirdos who found there, each other. Yeah. Some <laughs> characters. And then did you notice all of the baby oil on the vanity? <laughs> no. There were like five <laughs> bottles of baby oil on the vanity. <laughs> That is great. <laughs> and then he's like, come sit on the bed. You feel that? Doesn't it feel yeah. nice? <laughs> he's like, you wouldn't even, I can, I can jump on this bed. You wouldn't even feel it. <laughs> yeah. And then oh, that part, it's so, it's so uncomfy, but like in the best it way. <laughs> it's fucking hilarious. It's like, yeah uncomfortable <laughs> like like todd salon salons movies like the welcome to the dollhouse yes. and, like <laughs> that vibe like it's just so uncomfortable you're like so now we're all oh and then uh the wife irene i think is her name she starts asking adam about like kissing and acting and and like is it real do you use tongue blah 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 and then she like full-on makes out with him <laughs> yeah <laughs> and he's highly uncomfortable with this <laughs> There was no consent <laughs> happening. <laughs> and then she just goes on to like serve dinner. So they're all sitting around the dinner table. And um, I bet that ham was real good, though. <laughs> I don't know why, but I felt like it was delicious. I'm sure she, Irene's a wonderful cook. <laughs> <laughs> and then Zach, like, are you open to new things? So this is when you're like, okay, they're they're going to get proposition. Like, this is when it's <laughs> happening. And then we cut to the scene at dinner. And I love where they're all sitting down and they go, what wine pairs with ham well? And they both at the same time, Adam and Zach go, white wine. And I was like, <laughs> you guys are just little precious gay couple and i love you yeah <laughs> but like zach is feeling that the vibes are off and he's he's saying like adam's not feeling well we're gonna have to go but then irene and Berg come <laughs> clean with their ulterior motive <laughs> it's not the sex <laughs> no it's which, not which we were all waiting for yes, yes. it's a pyramid scheme it's an mlm yes <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> and it's called confederated products which I didn't care for at all. No. <laughs> but there's like throughout the movie, you could see placements of Confederate products. Yeah. In the car, in the trunk. I think you could see some, I think you see some, t I, I forget, like laundry detergent somewhere, but you see the different mm -hmm. products, which I think is hilarious. That's yeah. Hilarious. They're like, <laughs> they're like, everything in this house is bought through Confederated products and it's a third of the price and you can get in under us and we're not allowed to recruit anyone in the police force so we're searching for people in outside industries and they have like a whole sales pitch <laughs> yes and they're just like mm, we're it's, good it's so yeah. uncomfortable like why did they have to do all that to sell their scheme their pair it's their, so yeah. weird <laughs> And I love it's how funny like, that this is happening in like 1999 yes. when it's, now it's like such a huge thing online. <laughs> so <laughs> crazy. And so they kind of peace out. And I love how Adam says, I need to bathe in sin. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. So they're at the liquor store, they're buying a bottle of booze. And they start talking about how they each only cheated with one guy. And they're like, okay, at the same time, let's say who the guy is. <laughs> and it's Jimmy and makeup. Oh, <laughs> and so they're like, fuck, we were, we were cheating with the same guy. So they go to confront Jimmy and makeup. And this is where we get the scene with Melissa McCarthy. And I love how she's like, Oh, so you guys know now. One time you missed each other by like three minutes. It was yes. so exciting. I just love like as soon as she opens the door, she's laughing at them. <laughs> she's so like, like Who's... Oh, now? Okay. Yeah. And so they're like, okay, well, where is Jimmy? Because we got we got a conversation to have with him. Mm -hmm. And she's like, oh, he's at the rave. Let me get the info. So that's how Adam and Zach end up at the rave. And... 
I love how they're waiting in line to get into the rave and they're talking about their sexual encounters with Jimmy and how <laughs> yeah. Adam had to teach him how to do a proper blowjob. And he's like, and Zach's like, when was this? He's like, oh, like mid October. And, and like Zach thinks yeah. that, like, he did get a lot better. <laughs> oh like, my God. But like, okay. If Adam teaches Jimmy his techniques and Adam <laughs> and Zach are together, wouldn't Zach have been like, you know, this is familiar. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think he was more focused on the blowjob than <laughs> comparing um, it. The technique. Yeah. yeah. So they find Jimmy <laughs> and their retaliation is to com- cut his beautiful locks. <laughs> Just a piece to make him look fucked up. Yeah. So now they've accomplished their goal. They're leaving the parking lot. Adam's driving. He's a little lost. <laughs> but he's not driving slowly. He's like flying through the parking yeah. lot. <laughs> and he's he's reversing at at least like 15, 20 miles per hour. And this is when yeah. he hits Rana. And the scream they scrum <laughs> was perfect. It's amazing yes <laughs> i'm trying to oh my god now i can't think of it there's like oh it's like the scream that jonah hill does yes in accepted yes where... yes so good yeah and so they like rationalize leaving her they're like she's probably dead like it's <laughs> fine mm-hmm. uh so they go to the gas station he's pulling hair off of the windshield it's pretty bad. And that's when Adam goes into to use the restroom and he comes out and he's like, I was wearing my wire the whole time. So <laughs> we got a problem. <laughs> I yes. but I wonder be I wonder if it really was a problem because remember the the second cop had pulled all the supplies at, like it looks like he took yeah. everything apart. So I don't know if anything was really still recording. Yeah. But that scared, the shit, that scared the yeah. shit out of those two. <laughs> So they go back to get her and their plan is no body, no crime. So now they're going to dispose of a body. <laughs> I love that Adam is too chicken shit to even touch the body. Like he is <laughs> crying at this point. Yeah. And he's like talking him through like, it's just a movie. Come help me pick her up. <laughs> oh Don't you see God. the lighting guy? Yes. <laughs> and I also love, so this is like my very favorite part of the movie and this was the first movie ken and i ever watched together because i was like you've never seen go and so (laughs) and it stemmed from i quote this quote all the time anytime i see him in miata i go it's a miata from this movie because (laughs) adam is trying to rearrange the trunk to fit rana in and it's like it fits like a shoebox and a jack and that is it and he keeps just moving them back and forth and that's when zach's like it's a miata like it's not gonna fit a fucking girl so he's like no you just have to sit with her on your lap while we drive and that's the solution but then as they're carrying rana to the car she starts coughing and they panic and they're like now we have to kill her so he takes oh. the car jack and is like acting like he's going to smash her head. And then he thoroughly chickens out, which <laughs> surprise, surprise. Oh, and, uh, and then I love how he's like, okay, new plan. And they just <laughs> leave her on the hood of a car and set off the alarm. <laughs> oh my God. I love that those kids that she sold drugs to are the ones that found her. They're like, oh my God, look what happened to Kelly. Or was it Donna? I don't know. (laughs) Oh my God, it's Kelly. (laughs) And so like Adam's still not feeling great. They watch her get in, like be put into an ambulance. And Zach's like, girl in the ditch was our problem. Girl out of the ditch, not our problem. It's fine. I'm like, yeah. (laughs) 
the realization happening between these two. <laughs> and then we see Claire. She's waiting at the car. No one ever comes. So she eventually walks to the diner where they always meet in case they get separated during, I guess, their nights of debauchery. And then that's when she sees Todd. She sits with him. And I love how she tells him she, he's only medium cute. Damn. Uh, <laughs> yeah. In what world? <laughs> She's also 17. Mm. I, I love that we're glossing over that, but okay. <laughs> then this is where it ble- bleeds back into Simon's story. They leave the diner. They're making out on the stairs. And then the cat comes downstairs. He's like, how'd you get out? And then that's where we go into the scene where Simon needs to get shot in the arm to as penance (laughs) for shooting the bodyguard or the bouncer. And then we see Rana wake up in the hospital and I guess immediately leave to go back to work. And she's like carrying her like cash tray limping and Claire is at work too. And she's like, Hey, like hell of a night. Where's Manny? And they both realize like Manny's still oh, in my sh- And then I love how they go to find Manny and he's still huddled in the alleyway like a little mouse. <laughs> and then you see a very quick shot of an alley cat like walk past him. And in the credits, the cat has a credit. <laughs> alley cat is played by Princess Leah lucky buttons <laughs> oh my gosh i love that <laughs> Thank you. i also love how they have to go back to the ditch where rana was punted into to find the car keys so that they can drive home rana yes. let's talk about the fact that rana is walking like one of her legs got popped out the socket <laughs> <laughs> yeah there was definitely some limpage happening there. I like that when <laughs> when Rana shows up to work and she's at the cash register and then Claire is at her cash register and this is the first time they're seeing each other. She looks at her like, bitch, what's wrong with yeah. you? She doesn't ask, but she's like, what the fuck? And Rana's <laughs> like, things didn't go as planned. <laughs> and then the closing line of the movie is Manny... Just from the backseat, like, what are we going to do for New Year's? And like, (laughs) then No Doubt plays credits. And then Mm -hmm. watch, the best movie is to watch Go (laughs) first for Christmas and then watch 200 Cigarettes for New Year's. That, I think, are the two companion movies we never Hell yeah. For sure. I actually do watch those consecutively, (laughs) like, every year. Yes. That should be the new (laughs) tradition. (laughs) <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> and that is go. We did it. Yay. <laughs> Such a good one. Oh, it's so good. A classic. Well, we still have a few little fun tidbits. I <laughs> love that when Wolf and Moore are talking in the supermarket about the cheating girlfriends, Moore says, isn't it ironic? To which Wolf replies, don't you think? Which <laughs> they were quoting uh, Alanis Morissette's song love that i was did not know this but one of the few major differences between august's spec script and the final film is that in the original he had intended for rana to be black so that would have been interesting they would have never gotten funding for that because if they were struggling because they didn't have a bankable white lead yeah there was no way yeah And the letter X or the figure X is a recurring motif in the film. Malcolm X, Xerxes, Xerxes, X for ecstasy, Mary Xmas, room 66, the X Simon draws on his arm. And at the end, it's revealed that the rave was held in what is otherwise a triple X horn emporium. Okay. I looked it up. John August is not black. Oh, Okay. But he seems to be a little well versed. Yeah. He brings up a lot of a black a lot of black things, which is interesting. Mm-hmm. But he also wrote the movies Big Fish, Corpse Bride, Titan AE, the Charlie's Angels 2000 movie. Mm. Wow. So there's so quite he, a few he bangers. Per- 
He partners with Tim Burton on occasion. Frank and Weenie. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Big Fish, Frank and Weenie, and Corpse Bride. Those are all yeah. his movies. So That's awesome. Okay, John. Stop using the N-word. I don't care. <sighs> yeah. Well, we could have done without that. Like It, it wasn't necessary. Mm-mm. Apparently, sex is repeatedly a bad omen in the movie. Rana and Todd talk about sex as a metaphor for betrayal in all their scenes. I don't give my best friend's head. Simon is having sex when the hotel room catches on fire. Zach and Adam talk about how they both cheated on each other with Jimmy and getting their revenge on him before running over Rana. Todd and Claire on the stairs before they meet the strip club bouncers. So it's like a horror movie. Don't have sex or you'll die. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Megan, again, why don't you tell everybody how they can find you on Instagram? My Instagram is at tape girl with two eyes and it's just my collection page. And I sell VHS there sometimes as well. And that's where you can follow me. And you can check us out at no more late fees on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, YouTube, and threads. And now drum roll. Let's get to our ratings. Let's see. If Go stands up to our Y2K ratings, we'll start with you, Megan. Yeah, would buy, would buy again, (laughs) for sure. This movie has become, like, literally one of my favorite movies. It's just, I love how fast-paced it is and how, like, high energy. It just, like, never stops. And you basically get, like, three movies in one, which is really cool. But, yeah, I give it five stars all day. (laughs) I, I'm gonna, you know what? I hadn't seen it in a long time, but it's definitely a would buy. I still have my DVD. One of these days, I'll figure out how to use my player. But yeah, <laughs> would buy it again. And I watched this on iTunes because I own it. So <laughs> would buy for me as well. So it mm-hmm. is certified a Employee Picks 2024 movie. Woo woo. Nice. Uh-oh. I love showing people this movie for the first time as well. That's really fun. <laughs> It is a fun always movie. just like what the fuck is happening? Yeah, it's like <laughs> just wait. It it gets more bonkers. Yeah. Just <laughs> and if you want to join the conversation, hit us up at our quick drop nine zero nine six zero one six six five three. Twat us at the twitters, hem us at the threads, and you can be featured on a future episode. And join us next week as we celebrate the twenty fifth anniversary of the movie The Wood. And if you want to have some more fun. Come back later this week because we're staying around with Megan for a little after hours fun and games. And you can check out that wonderful episode and just learn a little bit more about Megan. We play, we're going to play some games and I'm sure it's going to be chaotic. So should be fun. And (sighs) Megan, thank you again. As always. Thank you guys so much. It's been a pleasure. We love having you on the show. Can't wait to I see what I love hanging out next. with y'all. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Keep bringing me back. I love it so much. <laughs> and as always, be kind and rewind.